All right. Good morning. Got just a few more minutes. Well, <laughs> a few more seconds, really, actually. All right, <clears throat> not a very big uh, live pool today, but that's all right. Hopefully everyone at least catches this on the rerun or comes in in the next few minutes. Um, I do want to mention that I had originally said that you had to be signed up for my math lab by, what, 11.59 p.m. last night or be deleted from the course, but eh, my math lab servers were having some problems. You already knew uh, a little bit about this because I was trying to actually, uh, you know, make your assignments visible or uh, remove a couple, whatever it was. And I wasn't able to do that until very late last night. It was almost two full days until I could actually do anything with the course. Uh, the advantage is, luckily, we didn't have to be doing anything with the course except reading, and that may have been available. And if not, you'll catch it today. But because of that, and their servers do seem to be fine today, I'm just giving everybody till 1 p.m. today uh, for the deletion, which I think seven out of eight people that were here last time already got it, so that's good. Uh, I am going to post a quiz on, I'm going to say some syllabus material, maybe one or two Excel questions, but mostly syllabus material, mostly just how this course works. Because usually what happens uh, when I'm doing a face-to-face class is I, I spend that, those two hours going over all the details and, you know, this is 15%, that is 5%, this is how things will be done, this is where this goes, this is where that goes, etc. And then I have to explain it 50 more times for the next couple of weeks. So I, uh, I'm doing this a little differently. I've never done a syllabus quiz before in my entire career, but I'm gonna do one for once. Uh, I think it's a good idea for this course specifically. Uh, and it's not gonna be anything crazy as long as you have the video from last class uh, and the syllabus, you should get a 100. I don't see any reason not to. But I'm still making that um, and I still have classes today. So I'm gonna be make, uh, finishing this tonight. So it'll be in Canvas no later than 9 a.m. tomorrow. It'll be due on the 26th. So you'll have a full five days with this. And remember, you're supposed to be reading ahead. Uh, so we haven't read anything yet. We're starting with chapter zero today. So wherever we finish, read the next section after that. <clears throat> uh, something that for some reason a lot of people don't know how to do, how to save a file, uh, whether you're in Excel or Word or whatever, you can click, click the floppy disk right here or you can click file and then save or save as. If it's the first time, uh, you can do save. If you need to change the file name, save as, whatever, but it's pretty easy. Uh, make sure you know where your file's going, that way you know where to find it. So pay attention to where you are saving things. So if I go to save as, and I wanna put this on my desktop maybe, I just gotta remember, hey, I put it on my desktop. You don't have to put it on your desktop, you can put it in your thumb drive, whatever letter that's denoted as. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So today, and I'm not exactly sure how far we'll get. We may finish this. We may come close to finishing it, uh, maybe three quarters of the way. But we're going to build the spreadsheet that Chapter Zero talks about, that the Chapter Zero guided worksheets talks about. So we're going to build that, and I'm going to show you the the worksheet notes. I'll show you the textbook notes once or twice as well, um, and then. What I would normally do is we'd be in a lab room today. We'd be in a computer lab and I'd be telling you what to do and walking around and I'd have you in pairs so that you could help each other. Uh, and then I'd walk around and if you're stuck, then I'd give you a boost and, and people generally do pretty good with it and everybody finishes it. And <clears throat> because I've seen it, I count that as a great. Well, I can't watch every single one of you right now. <laughs> uh, it would be very, very, very complicated, especially since some of you are in cell phones, some of you are on desktops, some of you are on Chromebooks that maybe you can't really use Excel with. So what I just want to do is have you, and you can potentially be doing this while we're talking today. Uh, I know that Zoom likes to take up the whole screen, unfortunately, and I have not learned how to resize it, <clears throat> but maybe you can just drag it to the side. Uh, you can use Alt-Tab to go between different tabs and stuff. Um, that's one thing you can do. Somebody said something. So that was the next thing I was about to say. Benjamin, thank you. Um, you can drag things to the side 
So like if I want to have half my screen be Excel and half my screen be that Word file, I can grab the top of Excel, drag it to the left or right, and then the Excel will take up half the page and then you can click what you want to take up the other half. And even after that, if you, if you put your mouse over the seam between the two things, you can click and then you can adjust them from there as well. Uh, some computers, it'll actually move both of these at the same time. <laughs> uh, this is different, apparently. My, my, mine, it moves both. Uh, but when I tried to do this with Zoom the other day, that did not work. Um, so again, the, the reason I'm saying this is right now, it's nice to have things full screen, but I'm going to be <clears throat> showing you how to do something on Excel. So you might <laughs> want to have that on half the screen and Excel on the other half, and I'm not sure if it works. I said, here's my, and see, I, I don't even have the, the Zoom window that you have, unfortunately, because it's different when you're, when you're teaching. Um, but like I said, you can use just Alt-Tab, hold Alt-Down and hit Tab. And if you're on an Apple, it's a different combination of keys, unfortunately. It might be Command-Tab or Function-Tab. I'm not sure. But either way, you could just use that to go between the two things. So the point being, if you can't build the Excel file while watching me do this live, then maybe once I have this uploaded to YouTube, go to that video, which would be very easy to take from side to side using the grab it from the top, drag it to the right. And then like we saw earlier, you can then select the other thing you want on the other half of the screen. Um, when you're in Excel, if you want to have these cells, the reason we call it Excel is because it's a bunch of cells and we're going to Excel at it, haha, uh -huh, puns intended. If you hold the control button down on your keyboard, which is on the bottom left, you can then use your mouse wheel to scroll in if you move it up or to scroll out if you move it down. And that's not the only way to do things. I'm going to teach you one or two ways to do all the important things, but there can be four or five or six ways to do things in Excel. I certainly cannot tell you every single one in a day. And there will be methods that you'll use uh, throughout the course that I don't necessarily tell you today, but in your homework, it will tell you to use. So today, specifically about charts, I'll show you one way to do charts. But in the homeworks, you have to read the instructions because they may say to do it just a little different. So that pay attention idea is very important. And then, so we said, I want you to submit this. Um, and, and it should end up pretty accurate. There's nothing super crazy in this. Um, you'll have a video to literally just copy paste what I do. I mean, not you know, copy paste with keyboard. You have to type, type, type. And then this is the most important note I will say all day. Practice doing stuff with Excel over and 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 over. Because you're not going to learn by doing this once. And you, you'll, you might learn it, but then it's not going to stick with you for a week or a month or a year. <clears throat> and some of you may go on to have jobs with this stuff uh, after you have this class, after you graduate from TCC or a four-year university, or where it, wherever it is you go. Or maybe you have a job for 10 years doing one thing, and then after 10 years you get another job working with Excel. This happened to one of my best friends recently. They just had a kind of a standard office job, and then all of a sudden they said, hey, if you want to make $10,000 more a year, well, we'll give you this position, but you got to work with Excel. It's not even going to be crazy Excel. You just got to understand the basics. And then they came to me and they said, okay, they didn't call me Mr. Beckner, but we'll pretend they did. Mr. Beckner, can you help me learn some Excel things? And I said, absolutely. And then we joked about me getting a cut about their 10 grand. Ha ha ha. But yeah, it was good times. Um, anyways, this, this is something that could get you a job. It could get you more money. You never know. And there are jobs where you have to do crazy, crazy things with Excel. And then there's jobs where it's just type a couple numbers, fill a formula down and boom, it's over. Okay, so let us get into it. So as a reminder, how do you get to your e-text? In my math lab, you hit e-text e contents, get the chapter you want, then the section you want and explore, and then it'll pull up another tab or another window, depending on how your browser is set up. Uh, so someone just said, I don't know what I would use Excel for in early childhood education, but regardless, data collection. So maybe you just need a spreadsheet of how some people are doing or something like that. And, you know, whether it's numbers or typing in sentences, uh, keeping track of scores, 
um, dates and things like that. There, there could be many, many application, applications. And you know what? <clears throat> Maybe you never use it. And this is just an exercise in learning things, which is still good. It's always good to learn things. <clears throat> But yeah, that's the, the famous question. What am I going to use this for, especially when it's something like the quadratic formula? Mm, I think this is a little more applicable than the quadratic formula. So like I said, I'm not necessarily going to use this textbook the whole time for this. The, the guided worksheets are pretty, pretty similar. Although I do, are they in color if I have it up here? They are in color. So <laughs> if you have these printed out, they're, they're black and white. So this is the guided worksheets. And just look at this one little bit. When you open Excel, it gives you a blank workbook, blah, blah, blah. It's got a purple arrow pointing down at sheet one. So that's the guided worksheet. And then if we look at the text, when you open Excel, it gives you a blank worksheet. It's got a purple arrow pointing down to sheet one. So we can see the strong similarities, which is why I don't need to show you both the entire time. One will function pretty much as well as the other for this chapter. Now in the other chapters, the guided worksheets can, you know, kind of take a little more of a right turn. So this is what Excel looks like when you first open it up. And it's usually zoomed out a little more, something like this. But like we said, holding control, using your mouse wheel, you can zoom in. And I just like that because I'm going to have multiple things open at once. So when you open Excel, it gives you a blank workbook. Note that it says book one Excel at the top. So at the top, that's what it said. You can think of a workbook as a three ring binder that contains worksheets. Note that at the bottom there's a sheet tab. So it kind of kind of like your browsers, you have tabs usually at the top. The tabs for an Excel spreadsheet are at the bottom, the bottom left. And it might say sheet one, it might have a slightly different name. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen a version of this where it went ahead and had three open all at once, just set up ahead of time. That doesn't really matter. So you can move to a different worksheet by clicking on the sheet tab and you can add a new worksheet by clicking on the plus symbol next to the sheet tabs. So if you're working with Excel currently, and if not, then you need to do it later, then you can pull up your Excel. If I hit, see I only have one, so I can't move between another page. But if I hit plus, it'll create another tab. And I could do this as many times as I want. I can make 10, 20, 30, 40 tabs. You can rename them as we'll show soon. And you can even see that when I open the new sheet, when I create a new one, it goes to that default zoom. You can see the difference here, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. All right, so now let me have this open. <clears throat> Excuse me, side to side. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why it does it this way, but that's okay. I need a little more room on this side though. What happened? Oh, now the <laughs> these arrow buttons didn't used to work to change the page and they updated that. Wow. New, new information every day. <clears throat> Sorry, trying to get, I hit the right arrow a lot. Okay. So next page. Across the top of the spreadsheet is the ribbon which consists of menus or tabs whose names are given at the very top, file, home, insert page, layout, formulas, data, review, and view. So they're a little smaller right now, file, home, insert, draw, page, format, et cetera. But you can see those there. Figure 02 displays the home tab. So I'm on home and theirs looks a little nicer. Let me just, Make that bigger again. So the, when you're under home, this is the menu options you have below. Well, lots of formatting options. If I click the insert button, then I get different options below. If I hit draw, I get different options below. <clears throat> Formulas, different options, data, different options. So the default is generally home. You can change your text style. You can change the font size. <clears throat> you can make it bigger or smaller that way as well. You can change whether it's at the top of each cell, middle, bottom, left, middle, bottom. You can do all sorts of other alignment things. You can change your number formats to a dollar or to a percent or just, just, just general. So watch if I just type a five here and hit enter. So if I go back to that cell, 
If I take this general button and I make it currency instead, changes it to $5. I'm gonna hit the undo button. Now this right here next to the save button, this is your friend. This is my best friend. This will be your best friend because I make 10 million errors in Excel and you might too. So that'll undo the format change. I could have also just hit this dollar symbol and it makes it dollars. Now, if you actually go under this little tab right here, you can change it to other types of currencies like euros or the yen or the pound, or you can hit more for all sorts of other options. <clears throat> or I can make it a percent, so the five will go to 500%. Now you might say, why doesn't it just say 5%? Because five is a whole number, is 500%. So if I wanted to see 5%, I would have had to have typed 0.05, and then it would give me 5%. If you don't believe me, let me type 0.05, hit enter, go back to that cell, and then hit percent, and there's our 5%. So you have to type the number as its decimal equivalent if you want a, a, the appropriate percent. But let me just undo all of this. Undo, 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 there we go. So for now, note the home menu is subdivided into groups. We already basically talked about some of that. Clicking the little arrow next to a group name opens a dialog box and gives you a full range of options. That was what I just did, the little arrow. So instead of just clicking the dollar symbol, here's my full range of options. Instead of just clicking general, here's my full range of options. It even has time and fractions and scientific notation, all sorts of cool things. So let's begin inter entering inter information into our spreadsheet as shown in the figure below your point. Well, I guess it's on the next page, or that's a typo. Yeah, it's on the next page. Imagine that you have <clears throat> a hot dog stand, and you want to create a sales order form. It is always a good idea to save your work early and often. Save by clicking, we already talked about that, <clears throat> choosing save from the list of options, choose where you want to save it, and then name it sales order form. When you save it as sales order form, and maybe you should put your name in there as well, then the title book one at the top will be replaced with sales order form. So I'm gonna save this thing as sales order form. So right now it says book one at the top, file, save as. Just gonna put it on my desktop so I can delete it after this because I've done it a million times. Sales order form, RCB, that's my initials. Put your name, please, and then hit save. Now at the top it says sales order form. Then these purple things, these are just, you know, shorter, maybe more important notes, always important to read. The spreadsheet consists of cells, which are labeled by their column letter and row number. Clicking on a cell makes it active. So we're going to talk about active cells a lot. Active cells are where you're currently at. So out of all these grids, all these little spots, we call those cells. So this is a cell, this is another cell, this is another cell. They can be denoted, so you can tell where you are by the letter at the top, which is known as the column. Columns run vertically, just like the columns on a house or on a library or a federal building, per se. So columns run up and down. So they're labeled with letters. And then the rows, which are horizontal, left and right, like the motion you move, make <clears throat> when you're rowing a boat. Just think about your arms moving forward and backwards, which I'm doing right now, uh, and you can't see. <laughs> but I am doing it. So the rows tell you how far up or down you are. And it feels a little backwards at first because the columns are up and down in terms of labels. So A is the first column, B is the second column, C is the third column. So columns go up and down, but the letter tells you how far left or right you are, which column you're actually using, which each column is, left, uh, is a left or right to get to. The rows, which are horizontal, tell you how far up or down you are though. So how are we going to call these? Well, it's based on the letter and the number and you use the letter first and then the number. So you're gonna say how far left or right it is and then how far up or down it is, exactly like in graphing in normal math. You go left or right, then up or down. So this cell right now that I have active, which you can tell by the green border that says where we are, is cell B, 12. Now you have to use your eyes to find out where you are, but the cool thing is this active cell, it shades the letter and the number where you are. So just clicking right here, I see the D and I see the three, so I'm on cell D3. When I'm right here, 
I'm on C18. And you can see you can actually highlight multiple cells at once. If I just hold the mouse down, I'm holding it and dragging it. So now I'm highlighting that big group of cells from B2 all the way down to C15. So again, cell, cells are labeled as the letter and then the number, the column and then the row. So that's an important detail. So like A1 or B5 or C12, as we've seen. All right, so back to what we actually need to do, the sales order form. Click in cell B2 and type the word item. <laughs> A bird just crashed into my window. He flew away though. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. It was really loud. <clears throat> Click in cell B2 and type the word item. Boom, and then hit enter. You actually don't have to hit enter. If I just hit, if I type the word item and then click somewhere else, it does the same thing. So make sure you did that in cell B2. If you press enter, it takes you down, which by the way, if you instead press tab, it makes you go right. Tab makes you go right, enter makes you go down. Why is my taskbar not pulling up? All right, Windows button, save the day. So hitting enter makes you go down, hitting tab makes you go right. So once we're in cell B3, B3, we're going to type the words soda, then water, then popcorn, then cookie, then hot dog. Soda, water. Popcorn, cookie, hot dog. Once that's done, we're going to go to cell C2. And we're going to type in quantity. And after quantity, we're going to hit the button tab. They say to press tab next, so then we move right. And after quantity, we're going to type in cost per item. Then we're going to hit tab, and we're going to type cost. If you don't want to hit tab and enter, like I said, you can just use your mouse to click from quantity to cost per item, type it, then click and type cost. Now you'll notice right now, they have the whole word of cost per item lit up, but we do not. We have cost per it. So that's because this thing is not wide enough currently, but we can make these cells wider or taller. Note that the cost per item in cell D2 will be chopped off because the cell is not wide enough. To widen the column, click between the column letters D and E and drag right until all the text shows. So between D and E. So if I click between D and E down here, I, that, this looks like I'm trying to move a cell, which is not what I wanna do. You have to do it up at the top. Look, look at the mouse, pay attention to what the mouse looks like because the mouse tells you what you can and cannot do. So if I click right here and I'm holding, I can make that column really, really, really narrow. And as soon as I let go, everything changes. I'm gonna hit my undo key or I can make it ridiculously wide, but I don't need it that wide. Uh, that was weird. <laughs> So let me just make it wide enough to see the word cost per item and cost. Okay. Now we're here. Now we're enter, now we're ready to enter prices. So click in cell D3, which is right here. So we're going to type in cost per items. And they say to type in one. Now I think the numbers are different. Or at least one of them, they say one, 125, a buck 55, and two. One, 125, buck 55. Sorry, I'm looking at something different. 1.5, 0.5, and two. 1.5, 0.5, and two. 75, yeah. So they have a hot dog is 275 on the worksheet. They also have 
the price of a water differently. We're looking at this for now. I'll change it later if I have to. So a soda is going to cost one. So we type one. Then we're going to put a buck 25 for the water. Then we're going to put a buck 50 for the popcorn. We're going to type 0.5. And then two for the cookie and hot dog. Then they say, we're, in, we're right now and we're in cell D8. They tell us to go to cell D9. So press enter one more time or just click it. So I can hit, I can type with enter or I could just click it, doesn't matter. Type in subtotal. Then type in tax at 8%. The at is if you hold shift in two the percent buttons if you hit shift and five, and then total below that. Now, ours say one, 1 1.25, 1 1.5, et cetera. Theirs, if you actually zoom in, you can see that they have currencies. Now, this is because I did something incorrectly intentionally. They said to type in not just one, but $1, they said to type in the dollar symbol, but I didn't do that because I find that most people don't initially. So what we can do is we can fix that with the, I'm gonna make this full screen, with the number format, the cell format right here. We can change those to dollars. So if I'm on the cell with the one, if I hit the dollar symbol, boom, now it has the currency. I can do that on the dollar 25. I can do that on the buck 50. I can click all of them individually and do this which is tedious, especially if you had, say, hundreds of items. So instead, I'm going to undo this. And I'm going to show you how you can do it all at once. Highlight them all like that. So you just highlight by clicking a cell, holding the mouse button down, and continuing to drag somewhere. So highlight those five cells, then hit the dollar symbol, and boom, you get it all done in one fell swoop. If it was supposed to be percents, I could, oh, no, there we go. There's our percentages, but no, they're supposed to be dollars. So leave it as dollars. All right. They also ask us to do some formatting choices. They say to make the two words in row two, or sorry, four words, I don't know why I said two words, all bold by first highlighting the cells B2 through E2, the same thing we just did. So click, hold it down, and go to the right, or left or up or down, wherever you gotta do, go. And we're gonna make those bold, so you can hit the, I gotta zoom back in, make this big again. I can have them highlighted and hit the B. There we go, there's our bold. I'm gonna undo it though or you can hold the control button down and hit B, that will also do bolding. Okay, so again, click and drag to highlight several cells. Click and drag, click and drag, that's how we highlight cells, click and drag. So they actually say down here to format them as currency, they contradict themselves because they say, Oh no, they did just say type of one. Never mind. I saw that. We did everything like we we're supposed to. I, I said I, I did something intentionally wrong, and I didn't. Because <laughs> it said down here. All right. So we got the highlighting done. Do 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 with the cells active. We're good, we're good, we're good. Uh they said to do something I must have missed. They want us to rename the tab down here where it says sheet one. They want us to have that called sales order. The way we do this is we just double click where it says sheet one. So again, double click sheet one and it'll highlight like that. And now you can rename it sales order. So you can do that to all the individual tabs. So whatever sheet two is gonna be called, you could call it something more specific. If it's gonna be called say total order, I don't know, you could call it that. Or maybe you just wanna call it Bob. There we go, now it's called Bob. and the undo does not change that. Let me just recall it sheet two for now. Give it a better name later. And see when I go to sheet two, everything's blank. Sales order, everything's there. All right, next page. 
caution. You must pay attention. What's that thing? I said? There's two things we said. Pay attention was one of them. You must pay attention to how the cursor changes when it moves over highlighted cells. So when you move over an active cell, your mouse will change. Highlighted cells, active cells. Highlighted cells, active cells, that's the same thing. So right now, soda is the active cell or the highlighted cell. So when I'm moving around Excel, it just looks like a thick white plus sign. Thick white plus sign. The thick white plus sign is just when you can select a cell. Select, 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 or highlight several cells. But let me make the item where it says item. Let's make that the active cell. Watch how I move around. See, it's thick and white, thick and white, and then all of a sudden, thin and black. And it's got arrows on the ends instead of just being you know, a flat kind of plus sign. Looks like a D-pad on a controller. <laughs> so as soon as I get to the green border, it changes appearance. And it's going to look like that around the entire border, except for one teeny spot. You see that little green dot over there? Watch my mouse. Watch my mouse. Boom, it changed to a thin black plus sign. So there's three main appearances of your mouse when you're in the active cell region. And these all look different than when you wanna make a column wider. See, look, that's different. Or if you wanna make them taller, see, that looks a little different. Your mouse changes in appearance. What's this? We don't even need to talk about that right now. <laughs> so let's not throw too much at you all at once. So clicking in the middle of the cell makes that cell active. So really, they say middle, but I mean, if I just do almost the middle of it, it still selects a cell. So when I say clicking, that means to do a left click. Right clicking, well, I think that's intuitive. If you right click, menu options come up sometimes, really good menu options like copying and pasting and sorting and inserting comments and formatting cells and uh, doing a quick analysis, which is tables, if you highlight several bits of numbers and then right click. So you can do tables with that. So click and drag, that's click and drag. So this is a click, this is a right click, this is click and drag. Okay, so the thick white plus sign is what your mouse looks like when you can select a cell. Select, 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 select to make it active or to make several cells active. We're down here at number two now. Clicking on the border of an active cell, so where it says hot dog, it'll look like they call it a weather vane or a thin black plus sign, as I said earlier. This is going to allow you to drag the cell to another location. So maybe when I typed where hot dog is, maybe that wasn't where it was supposed to go. Maybe it was really supposed to be down here. So I can take this hot dog, I have to make it active, put the mouse over the green border anywhere except that very bottom right spot because that's different. So anywhere else, but not in the middle. See, it's, that, it's that, that thick white plus sign in the middle. You gotta have it over the border. Click, and then you can move your mouse. And I have not let go, I have not let go. Maybe I want it right here. And I let go and it moves hot dog. Or maybe you at first put the hot dog box down here and you said, oh no, it's supposed to go under cookie. So you make the hot dog cell active. You hover over the green border, except the very bottom right spot. If I do that, see it doesn't move it. It does something else, which we'll explain soon. And undo because something weird just happened, right? Told you undo button is my friend. So. Make sure it looks like the weather vane. Click, hold, drag. You can also do this with multiple cells. So maybe I just, I, I, I put all this stuff so it was offset one row and one column. Maybe I don't want it that way. So I'll, I can highlight everything so it looks like the, the thick white plus sign because I'm not hovering over active cells. That's the only time it changes. Click and hold, highlight everything. Make sure you're highlighting everything. Now I've let go of the mouse button. Now I can click the border anywhere. Now I'm holding it and I can drag it to the very top left corner. Or I can go over the appropriate spot and drag it somewhere else. Or I can drag it here or I can, you, you get the idea. So when you hover over the border of an active cell, that's how we can move things. That is an excellent resource. The third one. Clicking on the box in the lower right corner of a cell, making it look like a thin black plus sign, allows you to fill the contents to other cells you drag over. So again, 
when you have an active cell, if you click the very bottom right corner, so it looks like a thin black plus sign, if you click and hold, you can either drag down or you can drag right, but you cannot do both. See, I can't like make a highlighted region like I could before. You can only go down or right at a time. If I go down and then let go of the mouse button, it makes all of those cells say item because what it thinks is, I just wanna copy paste this to a whole bunch of cells. So if I grab this, this is doing what's called a fill. It's filling formulas or text. So if this says item, if I grab the fill handle and move, all, move somewhere else, no matter how far I move up or down, it's just gonna make everything else say item. And <clears throat> if you look in cell right now, C C15, you see the word item and that's just tell, kind of telling you, hey, that's gonna make everything say item. Let me undo that. If I first highlight these five cells, so that was just before they were active, highlight those five cells, let go, then grab the fill handle. Let me just fill this down another six spots. It duplicates all of those cells, not just the first one, not just the last one. If I fill this down really far in some random amount, you might not get them all, you might get them all. Actually, I did that perfectly. See, there I just get a cookie, no hot dog at the end. So maybe you just need a lot of the same things so you can copy paste really quickly. So again, the three main appearances of your mouse when you're over the cells, when you're over an active cell. If you're in the center, it's that thick white plus sign, which is just basically selecting a cell or highlighting several cells. When you're on the border of it, that's your move function. When you're on the bottom right, that's your fill handle. Write those down. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That wasn't right. Not thin black plus sign. Thin black, let's just say the weather vane. The thin black plus sign, that's the same thing. That sounds like the same thing. I shouldn't say that. The weather vane moves the cells, the thin black plus sign. That's going to be your fill. And that's when we grab the bottom right corner of a cell. The weather vane to move cells is when you grab the border of cell. Again, the same things you saw, just putting it somewhere else to make sure that you're writing it down. Sometimes when you read something, you don't write it down even though I say write it down. Please and thank you. Okay, so like I said, if you didn't see that long enough, pull up the replay on YouTube later um, to get that. All right, so next page. Sorry, I've got something going on. Okay. The ribbon provides nice shortcuts that you can use to format a spreadsheet. When formatting numbers, it is important to remember that you are only changing the appearance of the numbers. For example, if you format a region as currency, the spreadsheet will only show two decimal places, but the underlying number will have the full up to 16 decimal places. So what I'm saying is, let's say in this cell right here, I typed in the number 4.598823. So this is what something came up to after tax calculations and it was something like a gas pump where it, it might say that you're putting gas in at $1.69 per gallon, but it's really $1.69 and nine tenths. If you look very carefully, that nine tenths is there. So it's 169.9, 1.699. But you really think there's only the 169, but that nine tenths of a cent is there. So you only see the two decimals, but the third one is there. Same thing is about to happen. I've got one, two, three, four, five decimal places but I'm gonna format this to, I don't know why that didn't work. Currency, I gotta be on the right cell. Format it to currency, and now it displays 
I didn't type 4.60, I typed 4.59823. Check this out though, if you double click on the cell, the number that you typed is still there. And in fact, you may have noticed that up here, let me hit enter, and go back to this cell, up here is exactly what we typed, even though it did not display that. It displays 4.60 because of the format uh, for the display, but it still holds the rest of the numbers completely accurately up to 16 decimal places, which is more than you'll ever need in your life. So that's a nice feature. All right, there are three ways to format numbers as currency. We already did that. Uh, so next, let's uh, talk about formatting the cells with the colors. So you can add color and borders by using the paint can icon at the window pane in the font group. So you can't see that right now, so I need to go bigger. But what, what our goal is, is to make the cells under quantity yellow and boxed in, and then all the cells that are a cost green and boxed in. So let's zoom, let's zoom this in, or take up the whole screen. So now we have all our options. So these boxes, we wanted to make a yellow, and these boxes, we wanted to make a green, but then there was also something else. So let's paint them first. Now you can do this one at a time. Go to your paint bucket right here. If I just click it, it makes it a highlighter yellow, but that's not quite the same yellow they wanted. So we do the drag down menu. And it was more of like something like this, probably about here. Not quite as highlighter-ish. Now I can do that individually, or I could have just selected all those cells. Again, not grabbing a border, not grabbing a fill handle, just selecting them all off the cuff. And then hit the down arrow next to the paint bucket, and then select the color, and it'll make all of them that. Also, once you have that color changed, it's the default. So that's not highlight or yellow anymore when I just click the paint bucket. You can paint all sorts of things. But let's undo everything that's not supposed to be there. There we go. So now I wanna make these some type of, was it a green? Yes, it was a green. So we highlight those five cells. I can't just highlight all of these because it wants this one to be white. So let's highlight these five cells. Click the down arrow next to the paint bucket and do it some shade of green. That one looks pretty close. And then you can do that again here. Now this time I don't have to hit the down bucket, look at the color under the bucket. It's defaulting to the last one we used. And let me delete this $4.60 cell. That was just to show you how currency uh, format visually works. So this is what you should have now if you are following along or if you're following along later. Either way. Now, if you look, look really carefully. And I hate when I put my mouse over this, it highlights things. See how these have these thicker borders? That's for emphasis. So let's do that here. There actually aren't even any borders in between anymore now because of the colors. So we can do that using this button right here next to bold, italics, underline. This is the grid. So if you hit the little arrow, you can see all sorts of gridding options where it will only do the bottom or only the top or only the left or only on the right. Generally, we like all borders. So this is my favorite option. So if I just do that where I have it next on the hot dog, it just does it for that one. But obviously we won't have to do this 13 times. So let's highlight an entire region. Then click the all borders. Now that is the default for the borders. So I don't have to use the arrow anymore. I can just highlight these five and click. Highlight these three and click. You can still do it from the drop down menu. You can still highlight drop down all borders, highlight, drop down, all borders. Or you can just highlight, and once you've used it once, click. So this again is just some visual flair that helps kind of separate items, numbers, whatever it is. Anything else that I'm missing does not look like it. Okay. Entering formulas. 
This is the bread and butter of Excel. This is what you will be doing most of the time for Excel homeworks. There's two main things that you'll be doing. Entering formulas and making charts. Those are the two primary things you'll have to do. You'll have to type some just numbers every now and then, but usually you're typing formulas. Usually the numbers are just given to you. So, you are now going to enter a formula in cell E3. E3, which is right here. For the cost of a soda using what we call cell references. A cell reference is the address for a cell in Excel given by a column heading and the row number. So when we call something C3, that's its cell reference. When we call something A1, that's its cell reference. When we call something uh, C17, that's its cell reference. So the whole point of this is, let's say there were five sodas here. Five sodas at a dollar each should cost five bucks. But I don't want to have to type five there. And then let's say there were three waters purchased. And that would make that 3.75. And I'm doing this math in my head, which is not the point. The point of Excel is to have them do the math for you. You type in the numbers, you type in a formula, and it processes it. That way, tomorrow, when I sell seven waters and 10 hot, uh, and 10 sodas, these two blips automatically update and I don't have to do math. I just type in a number. Oh, nope, okay, so this is supposed to be 10 and that would update to 10 times 1.25. And if I had 100 water sodas sold and this would update to 100 automatically. But it's not doing that right now. So we need formulas. And the first critical component of a formula is you have to use equals. To use a formula, to make a formula in Excel, you have to use equals. So you go equals blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, so how do we find the cost knowing the number of items purchased and the cost per item? You multiply them, that's all you do. This is a very, very basic principle of math. A total cost of items is equal to the number of items times the cost per item. Some people would call that a formula, I call that a concept. So we're supposed to be taking, in this specific example, the 100 times the 1, and that would be $100, right? But again, I don't want to have to type the 100. I don't want to have to think myself. I want Excel to do this for me. So I'm going to delete the numbers for the water. I'm just going to leave the 100 for the sodas for a minute, but I will delete it after the fact to show you an effect because they do the formula before the number. I want to see the number first. So they say to, to type equals. So that now Excel knows this will be a formula. Excel knows it has to think for us. And I need to multiply the 100 and the 1. And I'm not going to just type 100. I'm not going to do this, even though I am, times 1. Now it does say 100, but watch what happens if I change the sodas to 50. The, co the total cost doesn't change. So we have to make sure we're going equals and then using the cells, not the numbers. So the cell that the 100 in is C3. So I type C3. You can uppercase, you can lowercase, it doesn't matter, there's no distinction. Then I got to multiply, which on a keyboard, that's hold shift and hit eight, or uh, if you have a number pad to the right, you can find it. It looks like a little asterisk. So that's multiplication. And we're supposed to be multiplying by the one, which is in cell D3, D3. So equals C3 times D3. That's the same thing as taking the number of sodas times the cost per soda. Now, when I hit enter, <clears throat> you're no longer in that green box going to see the equals C3 times D3. You're going to see the number that it actually is, which is $100. Look, it even takes the, the format over here, and it uses it where before I would have had to have changed that in post. So check this out. If I change the sodas to 50 and hit enter, now the cost changes to $50 because 50 times 1 is 50. If I change the sodas to 1, it's $1. If I change the sodas to 7, $7. That is so 
much easier than having to do the math yourself every time. This is the point of Excel. Batch processing. What if analysis? Thinking for us. <laughs> now, theirs does not have anything up there. And by the way, if you double, if, sorry, if you click the cell where you type the formula up here in the, this is called the formula bar, you can still see what you typed. And they even do this in colors. Look, the, the C3 is blue, the D3 is red. And look at this. It even puts boxes around them in blue and red to say, hey, did you mean to use these two things in case you made a mistake? Now, in the, I have to hit enter to get out of this. Watch if I click somewhere. Oh, I lied. <laughs> Never mind. The, the way I had it set up, it didn't do what I needed it to accidentally do. I'll show you later. Don't worry. Now, they had nothing written in the quantity, so let me clear that and hit enter and watch what happens to the cost. It makes a dash. This is Excel saying, well, there's nothing over here, so I can't do anything, so it might be zero or it might just be something that doesn't need to be there. In most instances, it's saying it's zero. So when you see a dash in a cell from a formula, that means it's calling it zero, basically. They might be thinking, well, this sucks. If I got to type that formula in soda, then I got to type in water, then popcorn, then cookie and hot dog. So you got to type it five times. Now let's say you have a store with 2000 items that you sell, your Walmart. Do you have to type that formula 2000 times? No, you have to type it once. And in this scenario, you only have to type it once. So that fill handle we talked about earlier that I didn't really talk about what it does, I'm finally going to get to that. The fill handle is for filling formulas to other cells. So let's go back to this. Let's make the E3 active where we typed our formula. And if I double click it, you can see the formula pop back up along with the color coding. So I don't want to go to water cost and type equals D4, C4 times D4. I certainly could. I can do this. Equals C4 times D4. And then equals C5 times D5, etc. but it's tedious. Make the cell where you type the formula active. Grab the fill handle. So put your mouse over the bottom right corner of that cell so it looks like the thin black plus sign. Click and hold, so I'm still holding. Drag it down. Now you can drag it down just to the water or the popcorn, the cookie or the hot dog. You can go as far as you want. I'm gonna go ahead and do all five at once and then let go. Now what that does is, it tells Excel, hey, I wanna use the formula from the first row, but every time you go down a row, change the row number, so we account for that. So let's look at these formulas. That still says what we type, C3 times D3. Hit enter, oops. Double click, C4 times D4. So it knew to change the numbers to row four, enter. C5 times D5, enter. C6 times D6, enter. Look at the boxes. They're going to the appropriate heights. So when you fill a formula down, it takes the cell references that you used and it moves them down with you. Or if you fill a formula right, it takes your cell references and fills them right, or up and left as well, depending on how you move it. So that's what the fill handle is for. That's to make it so you type something once and then apply it to 2,000 other boxes to save yourself the time an effort. Okay, so let's put numbers in for the quantities. Uh, I'm just going to go pay forward a page. Actually, no, I'm not. Hold on for that for just a minute. They've got some definitions I just want to talk about. Um, we talked about active cell in the formula bar. This is the formula bar. Your active cell is the one that's highlighted. <clears throat> Variables are the numbers you input for quantities ordered. That sounds kind of weird. It just means they vary with input. Inputs are what you put in, outputs are what you get out. Inputs are what you put in, outputs are what you get out. So if I type five here for five sodas, that's an input. This $5, that's an output. So the quantities here are your inputs, that's what you put in. These costs are your outputs because that's what you get out of it after Excel processes it. So if you look on page 12 of your guided worksheets, 
Nope, wrong thing. Wrong thing. Where is it? No. Oh, this is it. Okay. I had it. Page 12. There's some definition spots that you can fill out. Remember, you're supposed to be completing these um, as best as you can. I want all of chapter zero completed. It's the later chapters that I uh, won't necessarily do that to you on. So formulas, cell references, active cells, formula bars, constants, parameter. We've already talked about all these except constants and parameters. Constants are just the numbers you put in like that five. Parameters are like the cost per item. So values that will be held constant, but used for formula processing. And I'm not much of a, a, a definition tester, so don't worry about if you don't have some exact definition for these. Don't sweat that. All right. So this stuff right here just says all that fill handle stuff we talked about already, which by the way, I wanna show you another way that you can do this. So at the beginning, let me clear all of this. Let me delete it. Before I typed in this cell equals C3 times D3, I typed it and then I hit enter and it gave me what it should give me. Let's undo that though. You can use your mouse as well. Now you still have to type your equals to say, hey, it's a formula. Watch if I don't type equals, if I just type C3 times D3. It just says C3 times D3. You have to do the equals first. So equals. Now you have to type the equals, but then you can now just click the cells you wanna use and you'll still have to type your math references as well. So I wanna multiply the five by the one, this, this cell and this cell. So I click this cell and it even moves around and it says, hey, Mr. Beckner, did you mean to click this one? Well, yes, I did. Then I can type my times. And then I can click the other cell. Hey, you mean to use this one? It's got the blue, the red. So we're multiplying these two, blue, red. Now when I hit enter, I get the same thing. I can grab the fill handle. I'm clicking and holding. I drag down, I let go. And that formula is now correct for all of them. There we go, it finally made that mistake. Sometimes when you're clicking around, when a formula is active, it starts changing things, then you just hit enter and undo. Enter and undo, enter and undo. So on page 15 of your guided worksheets, nope, wrong thing. More definitions on page 14, fill and fill handle. We talked about that. Here's the demonstration of how those formulas changed. Page 15, guided activity one. And we haven't finished this bottom part yet, but I'm just getting you started. What formula is entered in cell E3? Well, we typed in equals C3 times D3. So write that down. How do you fill it down? Describe what we did and make sure to answer all of those appropriately. How do you format it as currency? We discussed that. What do you think would happen uh, to the output of $7.50 if you mista mistakenly uh, formatted it as a percent? Well, it would give you 750%. Okay, we haven't answered all, everything though. So let's start putting in these quantities, which they want let me stick with the guided worksheet version. The numbers here might be a little different. The guided worksheet says we want to go 31342. So 31342. And let's also make sure that these prices are the same as the guided worksheet. As I mentioned earlier, the textbook's a little off. So. Soda seems really cheap in comparison to, to water. Why is soda cheaper than water? That's, that seems silly. So they say to make the sodas 250. So let me go back and change that. Then the waters are a buck 75. It sounds like this was just made more recently, but it wasn't. A buck 50, 50 cents, then the hot dogs 275. Let 
Anybody notice where I did something wrong? Good, because I didn't. <laughs> so we got three, one, three, four, two, 250, 175, 150, 50 cents and 275. Now look at these costs. All of them have been processed for us. I didn't have to do one times 175 to get 175. I didn't have to do three times 1.5 to get 4.5. Excel did it for me. Do you know what I used to calculate your grades at the end of the semester? You guessed it, Excel. Because that way I don't have to see here for a, with a calculator for 24 students potentially for each class and this plus this plus this plus this plus this. Da, 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 da. I'm not gonna say I've never done it that way. <laughs> I definitely did it starting out. And then I was like, you know what? This is going to be a pain. Let's start, let's start using Excel. All right. So then the next thing we want to work on is filling out the subtotal, the tax, and the total. A subtotal is just a sum of all the different costs. So a subtotal is just a sum. There is a built-in function. So I could go equals, and then I could click this cell and then do a plus sign and then this one and then do a plus sign and then this one and a plus sign and then this one and a plus sign and then this one. So that says equals and then add them all up, but it was tedious. Excel is about getting rid of the tedious. Now, if I hit enter, it's correct. It says $21.25. And if you double check your math, adding up $7.50, a buck seventy-five, et cetera, et cetera, it gives you $21.25. But that was very tedious. And what if there were 2,000 of those? Do you really want to do click plus, click plus, click plus, click plus 2,000 times? No, you don't. So let's undo. There is a built-in sum function. So Excel built-in functions, and that means something that'll it'll do it automatically for you, have an equals and then a word. So we go equals, and the word is sum. You might think it's add, but it's sum. So just go S-U-M. Then you open a parentheses. So the format for all functions, built-in functions in Excel, it goes equals, a word, then open a parentheses, some stuff inside it, and then close it. So here's the way this one goes. It goes equals, sum, open a parentheses, type the first cell reference, then a colon, and then the last cell reference, then close the parentheses. What this will do is add up a range of cells, whether it's five of them or 2,000 of them, without you having to click a plus button 9,000 times or something like that. So we go equals sum, make this bigger. Then you can click or type the first cell that you want to add, which is the 750. I'll type it this time, E3. Then colon. And then you can type or click the last cell, which is E7. Look at that. Watch me again. So nothing's highlighted anywhere. When I type E3, it says, hey, you mean this cell? Then a colon. And then when I type E7, it says, hey, do you mean all of these cells? If I type out, if I do E6, oh, no, that's not right. If I do E8, nope, too far. If I do E3, nope, definitely not enough. E4, not enough. E7, yep, there we go. Close the parentheses, hit enter. And we get the same thing as when we added them all up. So that's how you can do it with your keyboard. What if you like the mouse? Let's undo. Equals, sum, open a parentheses. Checkity check this out. You can just click and drag. Click, I'm holding, I'm still holding, I'm still holding. Drag, then let go. So again, why is undo not working? Equals, sum, open the parentheses, click and hold, drag to how far you want to add up, let go. Now here's what's cool about using the mouse. I don't have to type the, the closed parentheses. If I had used my keyboard the whole time, I would. Now you might want to be safe and close it anyways if you don't trust me, but I'll show you that it works. There's your 2125, let's undo. Equals, sum, open parentheses, click and drag, let go. Hit enter, 2125. But if I typed it, equals sum, open parentheses, E3 colon, E7, 
if I don't close the, okay, Excel's making me a liar now. Something has updated since the last time I taught this class. That didn't used to work. <laughs> I love it. That's funny. All good. Either ways, closing your parentheses is a good habit. You might have a version of Excel that doesn't work automatically. I don't know. Um, and you know what? Admittedly, I am on a different computer, like I said, and it's, it's functioning different. Maybe it's like a newer version of Windows. Maybe it's a newer version of Excel. They don't give us teachers the newest version on our computers at work, so maybe that's it. Ha, ha, ha. All right, tax. How do we calculate sales tax? This is a basic mathematical principle that you're supposed to know before this class. And if you don't, then you get to learn it right now. Sales tax is the product of the sales tax rate and the cost of the items. Some people would call that a formula. I call it a concept. Formulas to me are things like negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. That's a formula. A concept is take something and add it or take something and multiply it. So a sales tax is a percentage of an item and percentages of things say to take the percentage and multiply it. But you have to have your percents as decimals for, 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 for traditional math. In Excel, you can leave it as a percent. So for our tax, and they say 8%, so we're in a state with 8% sales tax, so we go, I'm going to do this wrong, and I, I won't say what it's, what's wrong about it at first. So this is 8% times, and then the 21.25. Now, this is definitely wrong because I didn't use the cell reference. I want to make sure I'm multiplying by the cell in case anything changes. So this would be wrong. So let me use the cell reference times click. Well, that's weird. Why didn't it display it? Huh. Well, maybe the mouse doesn't always work. It does. But that, maybe that's what you're thinking. So you go back to it and then you type in the cell. All right, well, it's cell E9. And that's weird. It didn't highlight. And when I hit enter, it didn't put a number. I didn't make it a formula, did I? I didn't use an equal. So that was my intended mistake. So let's undo. Undo. Equals 8% times. Click. There, now things look good. Hit enter, and you get the expected ballpark value of a buck seventy. Make sure that your answers make sense. If I got ten bucks, that's not eight percent of twenty-one bucks. Did I have to use eight percent? No. Let me undo. I can go equals zero point zero eight times, and then type or click the cell with the subtotal get the same value. But if I type equals eight times, click the cell, enter, you are not paying 170 bucks in sales tax on a $21 purchase. Uncle Sam is <laughs> messing with you at that point. All right, so let's go back to, oh, I'm doing too far. Equals, let's do the percentage one, 8% times the cell. That's my favorite version. And then the total, you always get a total by adding things. You add the subtotal and the tax. So we go equals. Now, since it's only two things, you could just say equals this cell plus this cell. And I will do that. But the sum function would work as well. So I'll do sum first. Then you could type E9 colon E10. Or I can just click and drag and let go. And it shows E9 colon E10. There we go. So again, since it was only two cells, what most people would normally do is just equals click plus click or type plus type. Same thing. Now, let me play with this total right here, this 2295. We showed you how to change to currency. We showed you how to change to percent. I haven't used these yet. These are decimal precision. So if you wait, when you're hovering over something, it explains it, increase decimal, show more decimal places. So if I click this, now it's not a traditional currency format because it's showing 22.950. And I can do it again and again and again and again and again. Maybe I just want to see that many decimal places. Hitting the other one, I think you can figure it out. It'll show fewer decimal places. So maybe I only want to see the nearest whole dollar. 
Um, I don't know if you know, but when you file your taxes at the end of the year, <clears throat> you only have to have it uh, rounded down to the nearest dollar. So if you owe, say, $22.95 in taxes, you really only owe $22 or $23. 22 is how the tax works, but if I decrease the decimal precision, watch what happens to the 22.95. It goes to 23 because it took the 95 cents and it rounded up to 100 cents and then 23. And I can't change it anymore because those are all whole numbers. But this number right here is still 22.95. Excel still has the right number. It's just displaying less. See, look, when I take it back, it still shows the 22.95. So there is a question, question seven uh, on page 16 about that, as well as eight. Okay. So we got all that. I just highlighted five basic Excel functions <clears throat> that we will use at some point throughout the semester, <clears throat> some more than others. Excuse me for a second, I got a cough pretty bad. Some average, max, min, and count, and they all do. I would say exactly what you think, except maybe the last one. Some adds all of them up. <clears throat> average averages them all up. So maybe you want to say, well, what's the average quantity of these items? So I could do right here equals. Now it's not AVG, it's average. You have to spell it out. Open a parentheses, you can highlight them all or type C3 colon C7, close the parentheses. So 2.6 is the average of the quantities sold of the items. Now watch, <clears throat> watch what happens if I change any. <clears throat> I feel like I have something stuck in my throat. <clears throat> All right, let's see if that helps. So if you added up three plus one plus three plus four plus two and then divided it by five, which is how an average works, that's what you get. <clears throat> I might have to take a, a minute and go get some water. Um, <clears throat> if this doesn't improve, sorry, everyone, for coughing in your ears. Watch what happens if I change the sodas to 30. Watch everything on the screen. Lots of things are going to update. The cost of $7.50 is going to update. The subtotal, the tax, and the total will update, as well as this random average I put in. <clears throat> and they all updated. That made the average much higher. <clears throat> made that cost higher, the subtotal, the tax, and the total higher. Max equals max, and then let's just do these. Gives you the highest number out of all of them, which was four. Min, so equals <clears throat> min, open a parentheses. I bet you can figure out that means you get the <clears throat> smallest item, which is one. So we did max, min, average, to, uh, uh, sum, then there was count, equals count. Let's just do the yellow boxes for a second, like we've done with the rest, and you see a five. <clears throat> what that is doing is counting the number of cells that have values in them. So it says, hey, there's a value in all of these, so five of the cells have values. That's what count does. Let me instead of going to C7, let's go to C8. <clears throat> so the blue box is showing, now I'm highlighting one past where we actually have data. So five of those cells have data, one does not. And it still shows a five. Now if I put a number here, let's put a 11 here, watch what happens to the five below. It changes to six because now there's a six cell with that value. What if I type a letter here? So it doesn't count letters as values. It's still counting <clears throat> those six cells, but it only counts data as numbers 
This F it thinks is a label, and so it doesn't count it as a value. We admittedly will not use the count function a lot in here this semester, maybe once, but there are very, very weird times where it's extremely useful. Like if you have a formula that uses cells without numbers, then the formula can't be processed sometimes, uh, depending on how the formula is set up. But you would still need it to return a number, so the count function can help as a modifier, and I won't explain how to use that unless we need it, which we won't. All right, so let me <clears throat> get rid of all the stuff I've just changed. There we go, okay. Da, 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 da. But some average, max, and min, those are definitely used quite frequently. And by the way, the formatting of how these formulas are, the equals, and then writing sum, and then parentheses, that's what we call the syntax. And then inside of the parentheses, that's your arguments. You don't really need to worry about those names too much, but they are definitions. All right, you can now, sorry, you are now ready to use the spreadsheet model or template that you have created. You can enter any numbers you want for the various quantities and the spreadsheet will compute everything else for you. You can change any of the parameters, cost per item and the spreadsheet will update everything. This is the power of cell references, which we've already kind of talked about. You can even make a separate cell in H9 or you know, in, in the real world, you can put things wherever the heck you wanna put them. But instead of just having this tax rate fixed at 8%, maybe your company is in multiple states which have different tax rates. So maybe you wanna have uh, this variable instead of fixed. So what we're gonna do next is just over to the side, put that tax rate value and then use it as a cell reference instead of typing equals 8% times a cell reference. So they want the, the word tax rate in cell G9. I'm also gonna change this cell. Instead of saying tax at 8%, I just wanna say tax now. We're gonna to go to cell G9 and write tax rate, colon, not that that little detail matters. And then we'll type the 8% here. And then they wanted that as a blue box. So let's make the, let's paint it blue. Now, when I type 8% over here, if I change this to a 12%, that doesn't change the 1.70. If I change this to a 0%, maybe we're in uh, Oregon, it doesn't change the buck 70 because the formula we typed equals 8% times that cell. We're not using this. So what we need to go back is clear this formula out and instead use this cell reference where this is over here. And I'm gonna leave this as 0% so you can change, see it change from buck 70. So equals, so we know it's a formula. Now we're taking the tax rate times the subtotal. The tax rate is this cell right here, so I can click or type H9, then times, and then the subtotal I can click or type E9. And when I hit enter, you see a dash because I have zero percent as a sales tax. So we're in Delaware, or we're in Alaska, or in Oregon, or whatever the other two states are. So let me go and make this back to the original 8%. So instead of zero, we're gonna have 8%. Watch when I hit enter, that dash under the tax should change to a buck 70. Sure does. Or maybe we're in Virginia, which has 6% sales tax. It, it, it's, so it it's used to be 5.3 across the state, then they bumped up uh, Nova and Hampton Roads to 6%. And I think they just made Richmond 6% as well. Maybe it's not the whole state, but let's just say we had a state that was 6%. So if you're in Hampton Roads, that's what's relevant. So if you're in Hampton Roads, you're paying 6% sales tax, which is less than 8%, so you see your sales tax go down, which also affected the total. Maybe you live in a state where it's 5% sales tax. So now it's a buck six and it drops your total as well. Maybe you're in a terrible sales tax state, or maybe you're at a restaurant, which is like 12% or 12.5%, 12.5 technically for our area. It is also city dependent. <clears throat> 12.5 is 
I think Suffolk and Chesapeake's, maybe not Portsmouth. I'm not sure. I don't know them all off the top of my head. Now that sales tax is $2.66. Now that tax rate, it says it's 13, but we typed 12.5. It's still there. See, it's still here. If I double click, it still says 12.5. <clears throat> if you wanted it to say 12.5, you can change the decimal precision. So I can go up here. Do I want to increase or decrease? Well, click and decrease doesn't help. There we go. Increase. Boom. So that's much nicer than just having the 8% fixed in the formula. <clears throat> so let's go back and make it the original 8%. So we see all the numbers that we should have seen originally. All right. Okay, we got 40 sodas and 10 waters and 90 popcorns and 500 cookies. And we only brought a six pack of hot dogs to sell that day for some reason. So this is our vendor. Now we had a really good day and we took in a lot more money. We took in that much sales tax. It goes back to Uncle Sam. And that was the total cash we took in and we can cross reference that with all of our receipts. So you can play with this as much as you like with the numbers. Do this again, do this again, do this again, do it again until you actually have this down. Like I said, I only have, looks like three students actually in here, no, two. Um, so I really hope that everyone's catching the replays. But yeah, all right. Nine fifty. Yes, we still got about thirty minutes left, so let's keep moving. Creating charts. You are now ready to go over, and we're already in the third section of this introduction. You are now ready to go over the basics of creating a chart in Excel using the sales order form spreadsheet. And I'm going to hit save. Make sure you've saved recently. From the spreadsheet shown, click the sheet two tab and type in the data as shown. So we're going to put in all this information down here. So we're gonna to go to sheet two. If you haven't created a sheet two, hit the plus sign. Let me zoom in a little. And what we wanna do is, and by the way, on page 19 of your guided worksheets, there's six or seven questions you can answer as well, which you expected numbers would be. <clears throat> Let me drag this over here. Zoom in here. And this is going to look, oh, there we go. I thought it was going to be blurry and it's not too bad. It's not too bad at all. I broke it. I broke it. Hold on. My dog is snoring. He's sawing logs below me. I almost hope you can hear. I don't actually hope, but it would be funny if you could. Sorry, I'm trying to get this set up well. Why is that not working right now? Oh, come on. Don't be mean to me. There we go. It's finally letting me move it. All right. So we need to go from B to F. So I need to zoom out just a little. There we go. <clears throat> so in cell B2, we're going to type revenue per item, per concert. Then below that, in cell C3, we're gonna type concert one, tab, concert two, tab, concert three, tab, totals. Then in cell B4, we're gonna type soda. I'm sorry you can't see the, the, the numbers to the left, but that is there. And water, popcorn. Cookie. Oops. Uh, by the way, I just did something. If you notice there, I went up on accident. It's because I was holding shift and hit enter. If you hold shift and hit enter, it goes up. Hitting enter goes down. I bet the same thing happens if you hit shift and tab. Yep, you go left instead of right. Hot dog. All right, before we start doing the numbers, there's some formatting. They want these bolded, so highlight them. And then hit the bold button or control and B. 
highlight the totals. Control B. Actually, they don't have those bolded, do they? It does, these don't look bolded. Let me unbold them. My bad. It looked bolded for a second. They have the revenue per concert bolded, though. There's some more stuff below. They have totals under hot dog with a space. Now that one is bolded. And they have a whole bunch of numbers to the to the right. But before they do that, let's before we do that, let's get the colors straight. The revenue per concert, that's a green color, so I wish uh all right, that's green, and the concerts are red and yellow for those. Okay, so this will be green. So let's paint it green. Whatever green you like. And you might say, oh well, that only does it for that box. Well, maybe you just highlight all the ones it's in and make them green, right? That might look pretty good. Then the concert labels, these were a pinkish reddish color. Maybe something like that. The soda through hot dogs, those were a yellowish color. Orangish, yellowish, something like that. And then these values in here, these were blue. Let's make them up. Well, let's do the totals over here. These were that same yellowish color as well. Uh, okay, that looks good. Sorry, I have to keep moving things around. And then these were that kind of darker blue like this. And then the totals down here, I believe these were also the reddish color like that. And they have the bottom right cell highlighted. So I can't tell what color that's supposed to be off the cuff. They have it just as gray. Yeah, it looks like it's just gray. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not gonna let me do that again. Uh, went too far. I didn't even mean to change the page. I was just trying to move the window. Technology is fun. Little preview of what we're about to do. <laughs> All right. Please just let me see these numbers for everybody. Jeez, jeez, come on. Come on. <laughs> Sorry about this. You can hear my frustration. How did I get this to work so well the first time? Oh, come on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Stop that. Why, why is it when I go over there, it moves it to the center again? Oh, my Lord. Okay. You can see the numbers there for a second. I got them in front of me. I'm sorry for this. But those are the numbers that we're going to type. So if you're watching a replay, just pause your screen and you can see it. <sighs> I can't just sit here and fiddle with this for an hour. 56. 30.75, and here's a reason why I say to have the guided worksheets in front of you, 25, 50, 36, 68. All right, you can also use your arrows to move from place to place, 63, 45, 30, 49, 74, 53, 48.75, 18, 44.5054. So that's what we should have, but I'm not typing the numbers in for the totals. We want to use Excel to have those formatted, and by the way, we wanted to have that one be gray. 
paint it a grayish color, darker gray probably. The one more thing that they had set up was that all of these had the borders. So let's make sure we have all borders selected. Highlight them there, highlight them here. Well, no, just on the three concerts. Uh, then on these, they made an interesting choice as to what has a border and what doesn't. Then also the revenue per item, they have that centered. So we can click center. Actually, let's not bother with that. That's right. They, they do something here that it's a little extraneous. I'm not worried about that being centered. You're never gonna be graded on something being centered. So that's good enough. Good, good, good. Okay. So what looks weird in comparison? Well, they have dollar symbols on all of these and we don't. So we should probably format these to currency. Highlight them all. Click the dollar symbol. And there we go, there's our format. So for the totals, we're just adding things up. So we wanna add this total should be adding all the sodas from concerts one, two, and three. So these were three different days, three different concerts our hot dog vendor was set, hot dog vendor was set up. So for here, we go equals sum, open a parentheses, and we need these three values. So we can click and drag or type C4 colon E4. So there's the clicking and dragging, you can see it. Or I can just say, all right, well, this one's C4. So type C4 and then colon, and then go to E4. And you can see that it's boxing up the ones that we wanna add. Close your parentheses, hit enter. Well, that looks weird. Why does it say hashtag, 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 hashtag? This isn't Twitter. Well, this just means number, 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 not actually hashtag. And the formula is still there if you double click it. And when you double click, it shows the formula and the boxes that we added or did whatever to. But that's weird. Zoom in or out. If you zoom out, so I'm, I've got control in the mouse or you can just, uh, it's somewhere else, view, I think. Yeah, there we go, zoom. And then you can change it to a custom. I thought there was a zoom in and zoom out button. Uh, it's okay, doesn't matter. Because I just like using the mouse wheel. We so you can see that sometimes it displays the number and sometimes it doesn't. It has to do with the width of the column relative to the size of the font, a few other things. So if you ever in Excel have that happen, it's usually a size issue. You can also make a column wider. So right now I'm not gonna change the zoom. I'm just gonna make this column wider and that'll display the number. If I make it too narrow, it doesn't display it. If I make it wide enough, it'll display it. So whenever you're in Excel, if you see that happen, <clears throat> it's usually because, oh my, I forgot to undo is all the sizing as well. Oh, dog, oops, come on. You can't play with my wires. <laughs> come on, buddy, you can't do that. <laughs> my dog was about to disconnect me. That would have been really fun. Okay. So again, too narrow, doesn't display. Wide enough, it'll display. Even if you make it too wide, it'll still display. Please stop licking my feet, buddy. <laughs> You're really distracting me. <sighs> okay. So we still wanna do the sum for water popcorn cookie. I don't wanna have to go equals sum, blah, 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 blah. I wanna use the fill handle. So how do we do that? Well, we gotta grab the bottom right corner of this thing. Come on, dude. You gotta grab the bottom right corner and do this, right? Well, that didn't work. I grabbed the bottom right corner, but it didn't fill anything. What's going on? Well, when I'm on the bottom right corner, it still looks like the thick white plus sign. It's because I don't have that cell active. Click, hover over the bottom right. There we go. Click and hold, drag down, boom. Easy peasy but you have to pay attention and you have to do this wrong. I can't tell you how many times I've done things wrong to figure out how to get it right every time. And every now and then when you're rushing, you still do something wrong. Then there's a totals box down here. This is adding up each column, concert one, concert two, concert three, and then the total of all concerts. 
So we got to do another sum here. We're going to go equals sum, open a parentheses. Now we want to add all the blue values above it. So we could type C, is it C9? Is it C5? Let's look, that looks too low. It looks like C4. There we go. That looks good. Colon. And then down to, is it C7? Nope, that's not far enough. C8. Close the parentheses. Again, use the visuals. This is saying, hey, do you mean these? Yes, I do. Hit enter. Oh, well, that column's not wide enough. I could zoom out or zoom in, maybe, or I could just make the column a little wider. Whatever you like to do. Now I'm going to take that formula and fill it right. So grab the box and just do this, right? Just grab it and do this, right? Just grab it and do this, right? No. <laughs> Make the cell active. Lower right corner, click and hold, drag. So this will be the total for concert one, then concert two, then concert three, and then the sum of all three concerts. And you can see you can play with the width of the columns to make those numbers actually display. And we get 695.50 for the total of all the concerts, which you can see on your guided worksheets and textbook, that's exactly what it should be. Now, when I filled that, it changed the color. And nobody's ever really worried about the specific color, but I can go and format that after the fact as well. Okay. To create charts, the point of the section. Charts are a great visual way of representing and analyzing data, or a way to analyze data. Not, it's not a way of analyzing, it's to analyze. So what we want to do is reproduce this chart right here. Now, when we make ours, it might look a touch different, and that's okay. But what's important is that the labels are there, the values are correct, the title's there. To create charts, you need to highlight information from the table. To make a column chart of the soda revenue from the three concerts, highlight the cell range B3 through E4, and then click on the insert tab. B3 through E4, again, B3 through E4. B3 through E4. So B3 is right here. So click. Hold, drag to E to E4, right? Well, that's E8. No, we want E4. B4 to E4. So here's B4. Sorry, B3. <laughs> then here's E4. So we need those eight boxes highlighted. Notice it wasn't just the three numbers. You need the labels as well. You absolutely need the labels here. Then we're going to go to click on the column chart command, and this should appear. The column chart, which I got to make this bigger. Sorry. What's going on? Hold on, is this hiding it? I don't know why it wasn't, uh, it didn't go to insert. Oh, oh well, it doesn't matter. So you go to insert. <laughs> I, I had something covering it, I think, my, my little sub menu that you can't see. So home, insert. So when you have the data highlighted, you go to insert, or you can already be on insert, and then you want to make this vertical bar chart right here. This is a pie chart. This is a scatter chart. You got all sorts of different options. Right now we're in here. Very often in your homework, they're going to tell you to use recommended charts. This is where people go wrong. They don't pay attention to those instructions. If they say to use recommended charts, you have to hit that button, and it'll pull up recommended charts to use. So pay attention to the instructions. We're just practicing the basics here. So we're gonna click the down arrow to select the, the options of charts. We've got horizontals, we got 3Ds, we got stacked, we got things next to each other. We just wanted this one though, the clustered column, not the stacked one. 
the clustered column. We got soda at the top, concert one, concert two, concert three. That looks pretty similar to this. Here we go. Now that says soda revenues, whereas ours said soda, you can actually click charts and move them. So with the chart title, you can double click it and edit it if you wanna make it more detailed. Uh, uh, all right. Soda space revenue. But because we had soda over here, it knew we were talking about soda. <clears throat> so that's why I put soda here. And that said concert one, concert two, and concert three. So that put those there. Watch this, if I only highlight the numbers. Insert, chart, column chart. Oh, chart title in one, two, three. This is very detailed. This is how you lose credit on homework, by not having labels. The chart title is easy to fix. The numbers are not. And I'm not really going to get into how to fix those numbers today. It is in the textbook. There are videos on how to edit that. But it just takes a little more time to discuss versus just getting it right the first time. and highlighting the labels as well as the numbers. Insert, chart, boom, there we go. Just pretend it says soda revenue still. Okay. So <clears throat> some tips here that are really, really nice. Click on a chart to make it active, and then you can use the Chart Tools Design tab to add chart elements to menus, to add titles, change the legend, and format axes. So when I say format axes, I'm talking about the names at the bottom that may not be there if you don't do it at the beginning. So there's a little submenu that pops up when you use that. Double click on any part of a chart to format it. Right click to view the formatting options. To make a chart, uh, a chart the size of a whole sheet, use the Move Chart command button in chart tools design menu. Chart tools design, so where is that? So after you make your chart, and if you're on it still, if you haven't clicked somewhere else, we're under the design automatically. Chart tools design, chart tools design. And you can add chart elements, which is something we'll be doing a lot later in the semester. You can format things. You can play with all that stuff. Okay. Next up, we want to make this horizontal chart. Create this chart by highlighting B3 through E8 and using the stacked bar options. If the chart does not look like this one, try using the switch row or column command button in the, in the data or group. So you can switch rows and columns pretty easily by doing that. Again, take these little notes down if you feel like you need to. You might need to. Uh, it's not something we really have an issue with often, though. So they want us to highlight B3 through E8, B3 through E8, and make a stacked horizontal bar chart, B3 through E8. So B3 is right here. E8 is right here. So now instead of just doing the soda across the three concerts, we're doing all items across all concerts. Maybe we're only interested in the soda, so we do what we already did. Maybe we want to talk about everything, so we do what we're about to do. Insert. Click the chart button, the bar charts. Now, you could certainly make a vertical stacked one, but they asked for a horizontal stacked like this. So what's the advantage of a regular chart versus a stacked chart? With this regular one, the one we did first, we have the concerts individualized. So you can say, all right, you can really see that concert one, we made 50 bucks in soda sales. Concert two, we made 63 bucks in soda sales, et cetera. So that's nice for the individual concerts isolated. In this one, we have the three concerts worth of sodas stacked. So with that, you are very easily able to see a total visually. Now, I can't see the exact number, but I can see that it's somewhere between 150 and 200. I could change the labels to make this more accurate. So it's probably like 160, 170. But it gives us a visual flair that, hey, across the three days, we sold more soda 
and we, we made more money off of soda than water, popcorn, and cookies. Hot dog is what we made the most off of versus just looking at the numbers, looking at the individual numbers, it's not as easy to see. And yes, you can still see it on the right column, but not if you look at the individuals. So this is just a nice different way to represent the data as a series of concerts, stacked. And it doesn't have to be concerts. Now they do have a chart title for this one. They say to call it concert revenue. So we're gonna double click chart title, rename it concert revenue. And again, my colors might not be exactly the same. They're definitely not. The, the numbers don't have to be the same, but this is an accurate chart. So again, you have to pay attention to what they say to do. They may have told us to use, um, what was that button again? Sorry, recommended charts. That's what happens in the homework a lot of the time. I'm just going off the cuff. Okay, next up. Pie chart. <clears throat> pie charts are ex an excellent way of visualizing things as a percentage because the bigger the chunk, the more you took in from that thing or spent, you know, depending on your perspective. So now let's take the data from B4 to B8 and F4 to F8 and highlight those. B4 to B8, then F4 to F8. So column B and column F rows four to eight. Let me just move this out of the way. So B4 to B8, so that's the labels for the items. Now we gotta go to F4 to F8. So we're looking at the totals, not any individual concerts, not all of them combined this way. You can only use the total column. But look what happens when I click and drag to a second separate area. I can highlight everything, but I don't want the stuff in the middle. This would make a terrible pie chart. You only use totals for pie charts. So I need these highlighted and these, but every time I click, the other goes away. Well, your control button or command button maybe for Apple, whatever it is, you want to highlight the first region, let go of your mouse. So again, highlight, then let go. Now I'm going to hold the control button down. I'm holding control, then go to highlight the separate region. I can let go of my mouse at this point. So my mouse is let go, and I can let go of control. And you can see that both of them are highlighted. So once again, you can highlight a region, let go. Let go, then hit control, then highlight the other region. Watch what happens if I uh, highlight, don't let go, hit control, let go. Weird stuff might happen. You might not see the weird stuff happening, but weird stuff could be happening. So just be careful. I like to let go of my mouse, then hit control, then go to the other stuff. If both of those are number values, that's when the weird stuff tends to happen. So now that I got those highlighted, we're going to insert a pie chart, which is right here. And you can make these weird, <laughs> pulley system things and all sorts of donuts, whatever. We want the basic one. Chart title, well, they want item totals. So double click, item totals, and there we go. Not the same colors, but you can see that the pie slices are pretty much the same size. Well, hold on, Mr. Beckner, they have percentages in here and ours doesn't. So we can visually see that this is about, you know, a little more than a quarter of the pie. This is literally a quarter of the pie. This is a small chunk, but I can't tell off the bat that 10% of our sales came from popcorn and that 28% comes from that. So we need to put in labels. So that's the add chart element I mentioned earlier. So it's a little small right now, but if you maximize your screen, it looks bigger. Add chart element, data labels. Now you can decide where you wanna put it. You can put it in the center, which makes the, the one for popcorn look a little goofy. I like best fit personally. Now, when I put this, well, what the heck? <clears throat> I've been talking about pie charts are great for kind of a percentage argument, but it put dollars in there. So that's the default. Now, 
Over here on the design, there are some ones that are automatically set up. If you click any of those, this one will show the number and the percentage. This one will show, there's more, there we go. If I hadn't done that, I think that's when it would just show the percentage. Yeah, let me undo that. There we go. Yeah, if I hadn't done anything, if I just use those automatic chart styles up here, it can automatically show those percentages. But I want to show it both ways, of course. So after we do the add chart element, we add our data table, we do it in as best fit. Then we go back to add chart element, data labels, more data label options. Write this down. Add chart element, data labels, more data label options. That's what we just did. And it pulls up this menu on the right. And under the label options right now, what we have clicked is value. So that's the dollar amount, the, the total that we saw in the chart. We want to see the percentage though, so we click percentage. And when we click that, it shows both of them and it's looking a little clustered. I don't really like that, so you can unclick value. And then you can close that menu. And now we see it exactly as it was in our textbook or worksheets. So now we got our nice pie chart. So let me show you this pie chart if we'd done it incorrectly. So that was the correct one. We highlighted the labels, we hit control, we held control, then we highlighted the other section and we let go of everything. Then we inserted the pie chart and we did the data labels and all that stuff. Let's do it wrong though. Let's say we did everything. We highlighted all this stuff, insert pie chart, 2D pie chart. Hmm. It's making a liar out of me. This is a weird version of Excel. Insert. All right, so the Excel I'm used to using at work does not do this. It, it would give you an incorrect chart. This is kind of unbelievable in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> I've never had that happen before. It's giving me an accurate chart. That's hilarious. Okay, so what's supposed to happen is something like this. Here we go. So when you do the soda accurately, when you look at concert one, two, and three, just this, it just gives you those three slices. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. Silly menu. As you saw, my camera works really well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So if you just have the individuals highlighted for the soda, you see the pie charts, but when you include the total, it also has the total in there, which is messed up. You can't have individual categories and the total in there. It ends up making it look like the total takes up more than it should. So this was supposed to be the demonstration of right and wrong, but using the whole thing. So this embarrassing chart on the right. Har, har, har. All right. So believe it or not, that is chapter zero. As I said, doing this once is probably not going to be enough for you. Do it again and again and again. Go back and watch this video. Pause it. Rewind it. Get everything you have. Because I, I gave some very abridged notes, but because I was pulling from the textbook, because I was having to use three or four different menus all at once, I did not type and write every single thing possible. So make sure that you have your own personal notes for things that you might forget. And this video will be here all semester long. So if you forget anything, you can always come back to it and use it as a resource. Yes, it's a two hour video that you'll have to hunt something down for, 
but on YouTube, you can hunt things down pretty quick um, just using the slider. So we're gonna call it a day here. As a reminder, I will have a quiz posted regarding the syllabus material, how this course flows no later than 9 a.m. tomorrow due by uh, midnight of the next class. We did finish chapter zero, so read 1.1 from the textbook. Read 1.1 as well as go to Canvas, pull up the chapter one notes, and read the 1.1 stuff there as well. And then make sure that you, and I, I don't have a spot for you to submit this, this yet. That's why there's an asterisk here. Uh, I'll have that by next class. So I'll tell you where to submit this no later than the 28th, a week from now. You should have this done today, whatever day it is you're watching this, do it immediately. But I need you to, to give me that file to make sure that I've seen you do it, air quotes, uh, sooner than later. All right. So that'll be it for the day. Um, I hope this was helpful. Again, I know it was a lot to take in all at once, so don't be surprised if you need to use this as a reference later and later and later. And remember that if you don't want this big long reference, you can go to my math lab, go to the course video resources, click videos, find now, and you can find individual Excel stuff that are listed by topic. So we'll call it a day. Have a good one. Have a good weekend. Um, make sure you've signed up for my math lab today if you have not already. That course ID. Uh, is listed in the syllabus in Canvas. I don't have it off the top of my head and I don't want to load up and find out what it is. So we'll see you next week on Tuesday and have a good uh, holiday weekend as well. Take care. Email me if you have any questions as well.